Hello. I've bought another video recorder. Another one? So, join me, let's unbox this, see what I've got, and see if there's any chance of being able to fix it. I don't think this is something I'm going to be able to do in one day, but let's have a go. So what do we have here? Cosmetically rather grubby, missing a little plastic panel there for the front of the tuner. It's an N1502, uh, which was the better of the machines of the early VCR uh, N1500 type format. And this one is possibly one of the earlier models because it has a captive power cable some of the later ones had a uh, figure of eight type uh, power cable, detachable. There's no AV ports at the back, it only has aerial connectors. Uh, it rattles somewhat ominously, um, but the screws were all there. There's a tape in it, but it's not stuck in it. The tape looks a little mouldy. I think someone's gone over this to try to cosmetically clean it up, because it looks like they've taken the writing off there. It does look like it's someone's tried to polish it a bit, so it was probably a lot dirtier originally. So everything is down to the heads. If the heads are okay, then we have a chance of fixing it. So, um, do I even plug it in? I think I'll plug it in and then we'll go straight on to looking at the heads. So I'll plug it into my isolation transformer. And very unusually, nothing at all, not even clock. That's unusual, maybe a power supply fault, but first thing we need to do is take a look at these heads. So what I'll do, you can uh, have this uh, Voyager discovery with me, I'm going to set up the microscope so we both see the heads at the same time. Let's try to get the microscope set up to look down on the head tips. Now of course, just because the head tips are intact doesn't mean that they will give us a picture, but if they're not intact then it's all over before we start, so let's uh, work with that. Okay, so we're looking at the head tip, the head drum, we'll take the head tip into view. I like it if we can get it to glisten in the light. Can you see that? I think I have a better view than you do. But uh, though it's dirty, it does appear to be intact. Let's rotate round to the other head. That's uh, a good deal cleaner, that one that's got nice glisten to it. Let's get a head cleaner stick and uh, clean it up some more. Okay, that one looks pretty good. We're not getting quite the same view, unfortunately. I get a somewhat better view through the microscope than you are on the camera, but uh, you can see that that's glistening nicely. Right, let's go back to the other head which is dirtier. That's looking quite good now. Again, we have a somewhat different view, but uh, I'm seeing that there's a clean and shiny head. And go back to the other one. 
both look very good. Let's clean the drum itself a little bit. Well that's a very good start. The head tips appear to be intact. They may be worn out but at least they're intact. We'll just clean the audio control head. Right. What else can we say about the machine? There's a control knob floating around inside it which looks like it belongs to a TV. That's interesting. There are two versions of the loading mechanism. This is the earlier type with the plastic gearbox. Later they had a worm drive system that's more reliable. So that's uh, yes, a control from a TV. Don't like the look of that thing rolling around in here. No. That belongs here. That is one of the switches, that's the record switch. What's going on? Why is that broken? Mm. That's the record play switch. So we don't know why that knob's floating around in here, but we do know that the record play switch is snapped off. So I need to make sure it's in the play position which is forward. I need to push it from something behind to make sure it's fully forward. I don't ever want to record on it, so I'm not that fussed about that. But I do need that switch in the right place. I could check it with a meter. So these contacts, looking at this one, which is, what button is that? That's the play button. I think it'll be there in triplets, so they'll be connected to the front contacts. Yes. And then if that button was engaged, it goes to the rear set of the three. Let's just check that's true. Yeah. Yeah, so let's see if these triplets are connected to the front ones. Actually, it's at the back, so it's in the record position, so I need to bring that lever forward somehow. Oh, what a nuisance. You need to get something in behind there and push it all the way. Because all the spring and collar is missing from this switch. Right, I think I've done that. Let's meter it. Yeah. That record switch is in the disabled position. I'll leave it like that for the time being. There should be a screw here and that's missing. So somebody has been poking about in here. Let's see if I can... Uh... There may be problems with the lubrication of these parts, so I won't necessarily fit that screw just yet. Let's first find out uh, why there's no power to the machine. Power supply sits in here. Sometimes there's screws in these positions and sometimes there aren't. Okay. Well, there's the power supply, and it exists. Is this how to cook? Cook up here? Let's make sure that's unplugged. Looks like the transformer might have had a burn up. Does that transformer look cooked to you? Oh look, the wiring's burnt up as well. All the belts are, um, I mean, you can see snapped belts or disintegrated belts here. They do replacing. But our biggest problem right now is this transformer. I'm sure that's going nowhere. There's a message here about a thermal fuse. I'm not quite sure where that thermal fuse is. But that transformer clearly is no more. So my only hope for repairing this machine is to replace that transformer. Okay, so live comes in here and goes to this terminal, I think and then via this thermal fuse. Well, I believe this is a thermal fuse. Let's test it, so. No, well, that's open circuit. No? It's not open circuit. 
Amazingly, the thermal fuse has not failed despite what's happened to the transformer. So, faced with a, a power supply like this, what do I do? Oh look, there's a... <laughs> just found a screw on the circuit board. That's not a good thing, is it? I've just noticed something. Screw is loose here. There's a screw missing, I think. Someone's been at this power supply already. Why is it that I can never get hold of something that's just broken down? Why has everyone already fiddled with it? I think there's several screws missing from this. This entire frame needs to come out and someone's had a go at removing some of it already. I would probably be inclined to replace the entire assembly complete with transformer if I can, if I have a spare. Yes, yeah, this. It's already been removed, I think. Here's an N1502, which I believe was dropped, so there's uh, damage in it, but uh, hopefully the power supply will be good. Let's have a look. Okay, there's some various parts missing from here, but uh, the power supply looks good. Let's see what's involved in taking the uh, whole assembly out. After much wiggling and jiggling, I think I've managed to free this up. I just need to cut some cable ties and then unplug the connectors. It looks like Phillips didn't expect people would have to replace the transformer very often. Let's unplug all these connectors from the power supply. It looks like some of them it is possible to put in the wrong place, so I need to be very, very careful. Good. We have a spare power supply. Let's fit that into our target machine. So here's our target machine and power supply. So I'll uh, deal with, I think I'll first fit the wiring loom and then I'll start fitting all the screws. So I'll get it roughly in place first because these parts here need to go in behind there and they're a bit difficult. Okay, so I have the power supply installed. Uh, I still need to fit more screws and cable ties, but it's installed good enough that uh, we can plug it in and see if the clock lights up or if it goes bang. So uh, wish me luck. Here goes, do we get a clock? We have a clock. Looks like a couple of the segments are missing. Okay, so we have a bit of a problem with the clock, but uh, that's not too serious. So now that I have the clock working, uh, I can start working on the mechanics uh, and see if we can get that working. Right, since we last spoke then, I've uh, fitted some more of the screws, so I think all the screws now are in place on this power supply board, and cable ties so that that swings up and down nicely. Now, we need to work on some drive belts. So this is a capstan belt, I've taken this off already just by slackening the screws off on this panel. The um, drum belt uh, falls off for past time, so that's uh, clearly gone. And I think this is the tape counter belt that's snapped and fallen out. So uh, let's see what I can do. I have found a belt which I think will do for the capstan, which is this one. It's about the same sort of dimension with a lot more twang. Uh, I have a belt for the drum, it's a different size but I've used these before with great success, got some more of those on order because uh, that's my last one of those uh, and the tape counter belt I'll come to later, I'll have to see what I've got. Right, now the um, drum belt is quite fiddly to fit, what I do is I slacken off these screws but don't completely take them out and then wiggle this and jiggle this until I can get uh, the belt around this um, around its pulley on here and around the top. 
case you're not familiar, if you haven't watched my other videos about these machines, these motors, this is the capstan motor, this is the drum motor. I think actually they're identical motors. Right, I have that uh, belt on the pulley, the motor pulley. You can put it on the drum pulley. and watch it fall off. Right, check that um, on the pulley OK before refitting the bottom screw. I'm hoping this uh, replacement belt will do. It's not for intended for this machine, it's intended for something completely different, but it is a looks like a very good replacement. And it sits along these brushes which I think probably provide a damping effect. I think that's on the pulley. Just try to keep enough tension on it while I put it on the uh, capstan pulley flywheel. That seems to be okay. Let's uh, fit the bracket back into position. OK, let's see if we can sort out the tape counter. Obviously that's uh, less critical compared to the other belts, but let's see if we can do it anyway. Oh. I'm sure some had a screw there, but OK, fine. Now we can get to the uh, tape counter which appears to be all smashed off. Oh dear. That's a sad state of affairs, isn't it? I guess we can glue that on. Looks like it works okay. We're going to have to glue that on, I think. I think I'll glue it, but I won't be able to fit the belt then until the glue is set. Right, while we're waiting for that glue to set, I've uh, done a little bit of lubrication of the deck, um, and I think what we might do is change this clock module because remember we've got some let's turn the light off, got some segments out here, so uh, it looks very easy to change. Let's swap that out with another one, which I hope will work better. And see if that's any better. Oh, good. I might look into what's wrong with the other one later. It could just be the uh, display itself. We have this top panel here, which is cosmetically a lot better. But remember, I said some have a screw hole in here and some don't behind the record button. So the original one didn't. Hmm. So would it fit? I think it'll fit. We'll have to uh, experiment with that later. OK, we're now at position. I've changed that clock. I've changed the um, counter belt, which is a little fiddly, and glued the counter into place. I think we're almost at a point we could pop a tape in there and see if the deck tries to run. I've also fitted a screw in this position. I know we need to replace the switch at some point. There's other things to do as well. But uh, I think we could uh, try the deck now. Power it up. Hmm. It sounds like it's trying to, well, lace or unlace, I'm not sure. It sounds like it's Yes, what should be happening when you put the tape in is it should lace up. So it sounds like there may be a problem in the uh, lacing uh, motor gearbox or drive belt. Let me have a look. I think there might be a drive belt on this one. I may have missed one out. Yes, there's supposed to be a, a drive belt, let me head out of the way, between 
this motor and the gearbox and it's uh, perished so uh, I'll take this apart and um, find about for that right so there's the motor there's the gearbox and there's one very goopy belt let's clean all that off there's a little bit of damage to the, some of the teeth on this rather well, strange pulley at the top so there's a bit of a limit how much I can clean it it's all starting to break up oh. I don't have to change the motor let's even get by with what we've done okay I uh, have replaced that belt that was quite fiddly refit this board into its place again and try again pair it up and it should try to lace hmm slightly weird the lacing motor is not the gearbox is not rotating look at that it's trying to rotate that way on this gearbox but it's failing so it may be that it's um mechanically jammed up so this was trying to rotate but only went so far and gave up it's a problem with the uh, loading ring being seized up it does feel like it's the loading ring seized up yeah. it should work should be able to get it to uh, attempt a lace up actually without taping now I believe I think that gearbox has failed. Well, we have a problem. The uh, top of the loading motor is all broken up, and the scrap machine doesn't have a loading motor either. So um, I'm going to have to come up with a solution. Ah, no, all that's happening is the uh, shaft is coming out of the motor, so that's no good. We're going to have to find a replacement somewhere. I wonder if it's possible to fit a complete loading motor assembly from a scrap N1700. So this is the later type that has a worm drive there rather than a belt drive. Now the gearbox itself may be similar. So uh, let's see if we can fit this. I think the way you're probably supposed to do this is to take the gearbox off, fit the gearbox and get it timed up and then mount this on the top. No, it doesn't fit because it collides with the uh, pinch roll of arm. Be a good job to replace that, but maybe I have to. Now this is the um, arm assembly for a 1700 machine. I don't think it's compatible. But now I'm beginning to wonder, is it different enough that it needs to be changed? Get back to this one, have another look. See there's a cut out there. So all this bodywork should sit in there, I think. It would be odd to come this far and not make the part interchangeable. But it is interchangeable because the gearbox height is different. Ah. If you can see that, the gearbox height is different. So, 
No. It's not going to be possible to fit this. Well, not without some serious modifications. So the problem is the extra gearbox height needed to mesh with the uh, worm drive. Could I just put some standoffs in there? Let's just um, temporarily fit that and see if that only is, is the only problem. And if so, maybe uh, we can do that. Yeah, that would all still go down. So I need some standoffs of whatever size that is, about six millimeters. Right, well I found something that's a bit long, but it's right. I don't suppose I've got two of those. If not, the other one will just have to be a collar for the bolt to go through. Okay, I've adjusted the height of that uh, loading motor assembly. Let's try again. Yes, I think that's um, more or less laced up, but I can't unlace. So I think the mechanism is working, but it's confused. So let's press play and it's engaged with the pinch roller. That all looks correct. But what should happen now when I switch on is it should unlace. And it's not. So it's a bit confused. I think it's not seeing that it's in the lace position. I can uh, use my power supply now to uh, lace and unlace the motor. So I think the mechanism's working. I just need to sort out why the micro switches aren't working. I don't know. It just seemed to be a bit back to front. So I've um, reversed the pullout on the loading motor because there's no guarantee that the wiring's the same on these two machines. They're completely different loading motor systems. Let's try that. Hey. Fast forward. Rewind. Play. Mechanically, it works. Okay, uh, having got it running, the next thing to do is see if we get any kind of picture. Now, unfortunately, I have to connect to an, uh, just an aerial cable because there is no AV outputs on this one yet. And also, there's no test for the modulator. So you can't um, put a test signal on the screen. You just have to hope. So uh, let's see if we get something recognisable out of it with the uh, with this TV. Well, let's see if I stop if I switch it off. It goes away. So that's the right area. It would appear that I've got sound and no picture. But we don't even know what's on this tape, actually. We'll get a known good tape, I think, at this point. OK, I've had a rummage in my spares cupboard and found some spare parts. Some parts I could probably have used earlier. For example, a big box of bits here includes... <laughs> N1500, uh, 1502 loading motor, there's nothing wrong with that gear. I could have really used that earlier, but now I've fitted the N1700 one. I'll leave that in place. There's lots of spare panels here. All kinds of goodies for 1500 and 1502 machines. So some of these don't really apply. I think there's some of those components that are used in the 1500 lacing assembly, which is not relevant to me at the moment. All kinds of goodies. Yes, I think this is some of these parts, I believe, are something to do with that. Not quite sure. Another good working loading motor. Oh, how frustrating to find that now. Lots of 
brand new parts, I think. What are these? What's this? this is heavy. Oh, that's not new. It's a pile of used, but maybe some serviceable idler wheels. Actually, this one, the idlers seem pretty good in this machine. Is that the only bit that is? So, uh, lots of modules. Very long spring. That's M1500, I think, isn't it? Oh, is that a brand new idler? Yeah, it's brand new, that one. If I do need one. This is quite a find, this. U517, not quite sure which module that is. Let's have a look at that one. No, what's... Oh! Motors. They might be new. Are they new? Don't know. But they look good. U65, I don't know what this is. Oh. One of the modules. So, lots of goodies in there. And you never know, I may end up using something from this box in due course. But I have another box here too. What's in here? Head servo, tested. That's useful. Tape servo, that's to say capstan. And this may be particularly useful. Good N1500 heads times three. Good N1500 heads, it says. Well, I'll check that under a microscope before fitting it, but that looks promising. That looks very clean and low mileage. Yes, let's have a look at that under the microscope. There's another case of me getting a much better view than you do. But I think we can see their head glistening. So that head tip looks absolutely fine. Let's turn it around look at the other head. Again, perfect. And again, you're not getting the best view. I think you can see that the head is uh, intact. So we'll fit that head carefully. And if you've seen my other video on this subject, there's a knack to changing the heads on this so as to not get into trouble with the um, drum pulley belt. It's best if you can change the head sort of quite quickly whilst holding the pulley at the back, not let it go sloppy and cause the belt to fall off. So. Uh, it's a kind of a, a fairly quick turnaround you have to do. So here's the knack. We're going to not let this go sloppy. We'll undo these as one and a half millimeter Allen key. Slacken off these grub screws. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to withdraw the head drum from the other side. But hold on to this. Put down the suspect head drum, but of course it's only suspect at this point. Fit the replacement head drum. And we can do up these grub screws, but we need to have a little end float. So we don't do it up so that this pulley is bang up against the bottom. So, right, there's no end float there and it'll stiffen up. So we need to aim for, I think it's about a millimeter. So this video recorder would not be a good one to try to operate upside down or sideways or anything because the head would shift. 
Good. Put the suspect drum to one side. It's not necessarily defective. We could have another fault. Okay. Right, do I want it to work or not? Well, in a way, not, because if it does work, that means that the machine was provided with bad heads. And heads are the really critical point in this whole subject. But if it does work, well, we have a video recorder, so, you know. Let's see. Yeah, it is working. So the heads were defective. Oh, these heads don't look any good either, from what I can see. Or they've been recorded on a bad machine. But I think it proves that the heads were faulty on the other one. Oh dear. This is some random tape, so uh, let's try a known good one. We have a good black and white picture. Oh. So that's um, disappointing progress, I suppose you'd describe that as, because a good colour picture would have been a lot better. There's a chroma board here and some chroma circuitry down on the main board there. Oh, mind you, we also need to check that the tuning is accurate, because of course we're not using an AV output, so let's just go for TV tuning. Now we really do seem to have a good black and white picture. Huh. So these are indeed good heads, but that's a black and white picture. Oh well, I suppose it's progress. So how lucky would I have to be that it was one of these two modules here that's causing a lack of colour and not something on the main board or somewhere else in the system? Oh well, let's give it a shot. Let's take out these two modules. And substitute them with a set I've taken out the scrap N1502. Actually, fitting these modules is not as easy as you might imagine. They have to be sort of lined up just right. It can be quite fiddly. Okay, so I did that then by fitting the PCBs first and sliding the cans over the top. It doesn't always work out that well, but it has worked out this time. Let's see if, by any chance, we have some colour. Wish me luck. I've not had much so far. Doesn't look like it. No. Let's refit the original two modules from there. Okay, a quick check that uh, nothing's changed. I'm considering um, a bit of a, a dirty work around occasionally you know on all kinds of machines of this sort of vintage the 4.43 megahertz crystal oscillator can drift out and the trimmer for it is there so I'm wondering about marking up where its trimmer presently is and just giving it a quarter turn each way to see if uh, ah there's two trimmers actually let me just have a look at the frequencies Okay, there's two crystal oscillators for 4.43, and I don't know why. One may be record, one may be play. No, well, that was a long shot, but. Um 
no harm done. Put them back exactly where they were. So what's wrong? Well, I'm considering the possibility of swapping out the entire signals panel here. Let's undo the screws. Just unplugging all these cables. Actually, there's not that many. I think that's a possibility. There is a one possible explanation, of course, is there's no real important fault at all. It could be the modulator, and we don't really care about the modulator long term because we're for AV outputs. But uh, this helps to eliminate the entire signals board, so I think we'll swap out this entire board. Okay, this is a signals board from the scrap machine. I need to make sure I've got all these modules plugged back in properly. Okay, wish me luck. Oh, plug the arrow in. Still no colour. <laughs> this is going to be complicated, isn't it? That wasn't plugged in properly. Try again. And still no colour. Or is there? No, there is. It looks a little off, but there is colour. Well, <clears throat> we have a result. But there's a bit of a strange colour band going on one side here, which you may not be able to see. Let me try some different tapes. Yes, it's there too. Okay, this is a bad recording. This is recorded with one head out, I think. But it's the same problem. There's a colour band over there. Maybe that'll go away when I fit an AV output to this thing. First, I'll just try the other Chroma AGC, which is actually its original one. And there it's working with that odd colour bar over there again. So, uh, you'll remember the original Chroma AGC cam for this board gives us colour with a line, which may or may not be as a result of any defect on this board. But we've got a the line going down there you can see on some images. When I fitted the uh, Chroma AGC can that originally came from this machine before we swapped out the whole signals board, I got a monochrome Im image. So that didn't really prove very much. But what I have here in our from our big box of spares is another Chroma AGC panel. Now I don't know if this is brand new, if it's new old stock, or if it's been in a machine or what. But uh, looks intact, so we'll um, swap that one in. So we could get either good colour, bad colour, or no colour. What do you reckon? Okay, we've swapped it over. Let's see what we get. Okay, we have colour, but we still have that stripe. So that stripe is caused by something else. It could be almost anything on that board, or it could be modulator, so it might not be a real problem. <sighs> now, I don't see this fault being caused by one of those crystal oscillators, but... Uh, I will give them a very, very small tweak to see.
Well, the part of the electronics it sits before the uh, Luma and Chroma processing here is the FM modulator and demodulator board, which sits underneath here. And it's again very easy to change. So let's swap that over with the scrap machine and see if we uh, make any progress. Okay, give it a whirl. Nothing at all. Does something wrong? Okay, swap it back again then. Hmm. The panel from the scrap machine's got a big X on it. I wonder if that's trying to tell me something. That's the duff can in this PCB. Uh, and that's FMD modulator. No. So we can swap over the whole board now, but just retain the FMD modulator. Okay. Test the whole board. Still there, but we now do at least know what's wrong with that um, panel. So though it doesn't help this machine, we've uh, debugged this thing. So there's a fault on the uh, FM demodulator, which is since there's so little on it, it's pretty much got to be the IC. I'll check the capacitors, but uh, I think it's going to be the IC, isn't it? Which is a TDA2730, I believe. So we know it's not the Chroma AGC. And we've tried many of the other panels too. Come back to another day. Right, let's call that end of part one. So what have we done so far? We've gone from a completely non-working machine, which had a burnt up power supply, well the transformer, and the various screws and things were missing and loose from this, so somebody had been fiddling before. Once we replace that, let's switch our machine off. We had the motor pulley, which was split and couldn't be repaired. And we thought we'd uh, change the clock because that wasn't working. And then, of course, I had to fit all the drive belts and things, which were service items you'd expect. Then we didn't get a picture because we had to replace the heads. Having done that, we got a black and white picture. And having changed various components on this, we ended up changing the whole of the signals board over. Then we got a colour picture but with uh, a small colour fault and we tried to debug that by swapping out the RF board 
And I think all we managed to prove is that this wasn't the cause. But also we found that uh, there was a defective can within there. That's the uh, FMD modulator. There's no way that that will have caused the colour fault. So let's not get too distracted by that. So what's the, uh, the bets on what's the cause of this fault? Well, I suspect actually it's the heads I've installed. But it could be something on the signals board. It could be something as simple as a modulator, though I think it's unlikely. But when I fit AV output sockets, I would bypass that. I need to borrow another AV board, I think, uh, another signals board from another one of these machines. And I think I can do that. So maybe that'll fix the color fault. Maybe we have to change the heads. Maybe there's something else, but of course, of course, there's other components that we haven't looked at at all, like head amplifiers installed in the lower drum. Hope it's not that. Right. That's all for part two. Now, there's one other thing I want to talk to you about uh, before uh, I move on, which is that I've got another piece of equipment coming in. And I'll lay down the challenge for you. What could I possibly be doing that I bought a machine that's designed to play tapes of this size, but it's going to actually help me play tapes of this type. What am I on about? So do please remember to like, share, and especially subscribe, and I'll do a lot more content on audio and video technology in the near future. Bye for now.